For those of you unfamiliar with the term anti-parallel, it means parallel, but moving or orientated in opposite directions, like a highway. You have a path where two sides of traffic flow, one north and one south, but the path itself follows the same route. Now take this highway to be life, and one end you have Allah, and the other end you have al-dunya. And in most cases today, believers are either moving closer and closer to Allah, or closer and closer to their faith, taking it into consideration in everything that they do in their life, or further and further away, being indoctrinated into the ways of the dunya and more attached to this world. This unfortunate sad state has left the ummah and all believers in general in a state that I describe as anti-parallelism. Now as this relates to Muslims in the ummah or believers in general, think of the, the highway as a road of life. And on either end, you have Allah and the dunya. And what happens is people are either moving closer and closer to Allah, taking Him and His revelations into consideration for every aspect of their life, or further and further away, being further indoctrinated into the ways of the world. When an immigrant moves into a new country, the first thing that they lose is their tongue, their language. And so they begin to blend in with the masses. And what happens is, after the second generation, they begin to lose their culture. So now their ways are no longer like the ways of the people of the native land that they used to live among. And slowly but surely by the third generation, the religion is lost. And unfortunately, this is surely what is happening in today's age, subhanAllah. Brothers and sisters, Islam is in a state of crisis. Just open any news channel and you can see Muslim lands being ravished and Muslims dying, some by the hands of other Muslims, subhanAllah. <clears throat> this is why there is a call that must be answered by the people of this ummah. One that relates to each individual and their personal journey, which brings me back to the point on anti-parallelism. This regressive state of Muslims being further and further away from their communities, less engaged in their deen, less concerned with Allah, and at the same time being further indoctrinated into their Western culture or mentality, is a phenomenon that's occurring across the globe. And ironically, on the other side, we still have, on a grander scale, more Muslims increasing in number and society becoming more tolerant of them. You see, the recent revival that has occurred from this exposure on the global stage has sparked the curiosity of the masses to find out what is Islam? What are these people all about? What do they believe in? But the downside is that no one has stepped up to define it. And as a result, people are just filling in the blanks with associations of culture or even personal habits or traits. For example, if you see a Sikh brother walking down the street because he has a turban on his head, most will make the assumption that he's Muslim. Or on the other hand, if you see a Middle Eastern Arab speaking Arabic, wearing normal clothes, the same association or assumption will be made. And the problem is that no one is there to define, for example, that Coptics, a Christian-based religion, has been nested in the Middle East since the time of the Roman Empire. And th these are the effects. And so Muslims these days, especially the second and third generation, have almost been removed from the culture of their forefathers. They walk, talk, dress, eat, work, spend, and entertain themselves, just like any other person in this country, because they want to fit in. And I remember what it was like growing up, when my uncles would come to me and say, Hey man, what's up? They wanted to be pragmatically correct. They wanted to fit in. And what this did, instead of them coming up to me and saying, Salaam Alaikum, would then make me feel as if that was the wrong thing to do. It would psychologically affect the way that I think, making me feel less and less proud to be a Muslim. And eventually this psychological stronghold took root. And what I did was appeal to the streets, appeal to my friends, as opposed to appealing to the masjid and appealing to the Quran and appealing to the hadith. Reflect on this, Ya Akhwan. You see, these, the children in the second, third generation, your sons and your daughters, they speak a different language than you. And for those of you that are younger, keep in mind that the ways of this world, they're not what's beneficial for you in the hereafter. And it is far better for you to be a gharib, someone who is strange, than to be someone who is normal, blending in with the masses. 
And this mentality is now being reinforced by all types of people across the world. Like the female activist, for example, who goes around, I won't say her name, but is speaking at universities across the country claiming that the term hijab was puffed up by fundamentalists taken out of scope from the Quran and leveraged to deny women their right. Basically saying that when in Rome, women should dress like the Romans according to their societal and environmental needs and its demands. Another example of a prominent Christian pastor with hundreds of thousands of viewers who claims that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, created the religion as a political strategy to unite the Quraysh, not through revelation, but out of imagination following in the steps of Abraham. But you know what, I can't blame him, and I can't judge for two reasons. One, there is nobody to correct him. You may get someone who does some interfaith work here and there, but no one on the grand scale at a global level defining this is Islam, this is what we believe in, this is how our religion was created, etc. And secondly, because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, warned us that those that live among the mushrikun will become one and the same. And those that take the mushrikun for friends will become like them. And these small seeds is how it starts. And this is what's happening across most Western societies. Mufti Hussein Kamani, as stated from one of his khutbas, quoting someone I believe, said that when an immigrant moves into a new country, the first thing that they lose is their tongue, their language. And so they begin to blend in with the masses. And this is one of those seeds that I talked about. And then secondly, that seed takes root, and what happens is, after the second generation, they begin to lose their culture. So now their ways are no longer like the ways of the people of the native land that they used to live among. And so that root grows a little bit further into a plant, and slowly but surely by the third generation, the religion is lost. And unfortunately, this is surely what is happening in today's age, subhanAllah. But don't get me wrong, it's not all bad, and not all people that talk about Islam are talking about it in a bad light or in an improper way. For example, Gary Wills, the, the author of the book What the Quran Meant and Why It Matters, is actually spreading a very positive message about Quran, citing only truth from the Quran directly, discrediting some of these bogus perceptions. But my question remains is why do we have non-Muslims teaching others about Islam in the first place? Why have Muslims become so content that when they hear something negative being portrayed about Islam, they brush it off their shoulders? Know that the life of this world is but an amusement, a diversion, an adornment, and boasting to one another in competition, an in increase of wealth and children. The Ummah has become distracted. We no longer take such things into consideration. We have left our ways and have become like those we live among. And our concerns have that become of that of the dunya, not of the hereafter. See, Islam for most people today is like a country club. We join in the practices as if it involves food or holidays or celebration or the opportunity for money or recognition, but rarely do people go out of their way for Islam anymore. Now I know this isn't a very nice message, but I want you to take it seriously. And I want you to understand that there are things new levels that we must reach, things that we must do that we haven't done before. We have to dig deeper. We have to really understand and become filled with the conviction of what we're doing. No longer just going through the motion. Please don't get offended, brothers and sisters. I've asked myself these very questions hundreds of times and even asked Allah to help me find the answer. Questions like, what am I doing here? Why am I here on this earth? For those of you that immigrated now, I'm asking you, why are you here in the United States? Why did you come here? Now don't get me wrong. It's good that you came here for a better quality of life and you found comfort here and the ability to do more. But with that added comfort, you should add then to your responsibilities or your obligations to this ummah. I encourage you all to reflect on this. Do you do the things that you do in life out of direction from Allah or of seeking personal fulfillment because of what you heard and what you saw? You see, millions of Muslims, millions of Muslims have done this. Left their homes, their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their cousins, their classmates, their countries, and migrated. Not for the cause of Allah. Not to escape persecution because of their religion. Not because they couldn't find anything to eat. But more likely for the US dollar or for the things they heard about the new country where you can go and pick money like leaves from a tree. 
And you see what happens when people come here is these are the lies that they spread. They don't tell them the truth that they work 12 hour days, that they live in slums and ghettos, or that they're barely afloat and one small incident would render them bankrupt. They don't tell them the amount of stress that they deal with. They don't tell them how they're losing their culture and their children are losing their cultures and religion. And then when they go home, they return with bags full of gifts and fifths, fists full of dollars and boasting and flashing and bragging without any consideration to the psychological effects that it has on those back home. Painting a picture that life in the West is easy and that those back home are suffering. And no one gives consideration to these things anymore. And so what happens is that all these rebellions occur and no one questions to sit and ponder what, what, what happened, what is causing these people in Libya and Sudan and Yemen and Syria to, to, to rebel. And people say, no, Brother Suhaib, this is because they want to have a better life. Okay, but what has their definition of a better life become? Has it not been tainted by Facebook and Instagram and YouTube? Has it not been out of the d desire for fancy cars and fancy clothes and lavish buildings and subhanAllah, dunya, 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 dunya. What a cheap price. What a cheap price to sell your eternal life in the hereafter for a temporary period of comfort of only 70 or 80 years in this dunya. And what makes matters worse is that we don't even know what we're here to attain. We don't even humble ourselves to ask what it is that we can do for Allah. Today's Muslims don't even really fully understand the journey of Islam. Allah warns us that the life of this world is a distraction. Do you truly understand what it is that you're being distracted from? In Surah 45 verse 22, Allah Zawajal tells us, Allah created the heavens and the earth in truth, so that every soul may be recompensed for what it has earned and they will not be wrong. Have you asked yourself what is this truth, brothers and sisters? I beseech you, take responsibility for your souls, because neither I or nor anyone else can bear the burden of another on the day of judgment. No one will be able to point and say, He deceived me, because they will forsake you on that day. Even your hands and your feet and the members of your body will forsake you on that day, saying that you never used to hide yourself from us. So many clear signs and eyes, but most cannot see. And not equal are the blind and the seeing, nor those who believe and do righteous deeds and the evildoer. Little do you remember. Do we even realize that we have forgotten something? The Ummah is in a state of crisis, brothers and sisters. And as Muslims, it is your obligation not just to do your five prayers, zakat, fasting, hajj. No, that is your fard, that is your obligation to Allah as a Muslim. You owe more than this to the Ummah, to your children, to your families, to the countless men and women who died protecting this religion over a thousand years ago, and to the countless children and women and men who are dying now because of what this religion has become. But I warn you, don't look at me or anyone else that comes up here to speak to tell you what you need to do. You must fully submit to Allah and His will. No more of this one foot in, one foot out. Set aside extra hours of TV at night so that you can wake up and pray in the middle of the night. Set aside four or five meals a week so that you can fast on Mondays and Thursdays so that you can purify your spirit and unblock your heart and put a gap of separation between you and this dunya and your desires. Get involved, find a way to give back, even reach out to your neighbors and just let them see a good example of a Muslim. And I guarantee you the conversation will come up one day. Are you a Muslim? Yes, I am. Can you tell me a little bit more? And that is your opportunity to spread a good word. Start right here in the masjid. I'm sad to say that I don't know many of you brothers by name. Take your time to volunteer and teach children about Islam. Start a WhatsApp group to discuss and share more about the deen instead of the countless nonsense that we talk about on a daily basis, information that will not benefit us in the hereafter. Slowly do your part to change this ummah, and inshallah, inshallah, bi'idhnillah, it will be returned to its glory. Brothers and sisters, the ummah is weak. We have been deceived and are selling our ihsan for a cheap price. The children of the book, Bani Israel, the Christians and the Jews before them, were warned by Sayyidina Suleiman alayhi salam, where he told them as quoted from a certain text, everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Is there any one of you that can say, look, this is something new? It was already here long ago, and then this too is then meaningless. 
a chasing after wind. Subhanallah. Have they not traveled through the land to see what was the end of those before them? And Allah tells us they were greater than you in power. And Allah would never have wronged them, but they wronged themselves. Try to change your perspective. Try to look back, not just on Pharaoh and the other ancient times, but those that are stand before you this very day. For those of you younger, go to the ones who you want to be, the doctors and the lawyers of the current age, or whatever it is that you want to be, and ask them, what was the hardest part of your journey? What did you have to sacrifice? Can you have done it better? Ask them for advice so that you do not fall in the same footsteps of sacrificing your wealth in the hereafter for the wealth of the dunya. Do not let this ummah fall like those before us. I ask that Allah help everyone see this truth. I ask that Allah help strengthen the ummah and unite Muslims all across the world.